The following is a presentation of Chandler Christian Church in Chandler, Arizona. For more information, please go to www.chandlercc.org. Right. Well, what we're talking about today is indeed uh, that powerful bit of our mouth. How many of you know what is ounce for ounce the most strong, the most powerful muscle in the body. You know, a lot of people think it's the heart, but it really isn't. In fact, ounce for ounce, the most powerful muscle in the body is your tongue. There are groups of muscles that work together, of course, are much stronger than the tongue, but the tongue, ounce for ounce, is the most powerful muscle in the body. In fact, if you don't think that's true, let me give you a little experiment. Now, you don't want to do it if you've been shaking hands, your hands are dirty, but if you have a clean hand, you can stick it inside your mouth and stick your tongue into the roof of your mouth. Don't stick it back too far, you'll throw up. But stick it up in the roof of your mouth, and then stick your tongue up next to it, and trap your little finger in the roof of your mouth, and then you have a little bit of a tongue war. And you see if you can pull it down and push it down, your tongue down with your little finger, and you won't be able to do it. In fact, depending on how strong your hands are, uh, you, you can't use any of your fingers to do so. And when you do, you're actually using a combination of muscles to do that. That is just how powerful and how strong your tongue is. But the tongue is just an example of the incredible power of our words, of our speech. And it's something that we need to give attention to. In fact, let me share some startling statistics uh, with you here. The average American has 30 conversations a day, 30 conversations a day. Uh, some of you have most of those when you come home from work but uh, you have 30 conversations a day. About one-fifth or 20% of your life will be spent talking to people. In a given year, you would fill 66 books of 800 pages in length or 52,800 pages of words in just one year period of time. The average man speaks 20,000 words a day. The average woman speaks 30,000 words a day. Do you see why there's some problems that go on there in that circumstance? People can hear and comprehend about 600 to 1,000 words per minute. And yet the average speaker speaks about 125 to 175 words a minute. On average, that means there's a 650-word boredom factor that goes on when you're talking with people. That's why you can come on and talk to people and be thinking about what you're going to have for lunch today and what you're going to do this afternoon and what you're going to post on Facebook at the same time you're communicating with other people. And that's one of the reasons why I speak so fast when I preach so I can keep your attention and not let your minds wander too far. This weekend, 55 million Americans will listen to 400,000 pastors deliver over 1 billion words, and when it's all said and done, a lot more is said than is ever done, and that is the problem. Now, there are a lot of ways that we can communicate. You can communicate with body language. How many of you have ever seen someone do this to you? You know what that means, right? Or, or do this to you. And so we can communicate with our posture, with our body language. But you can also communicate with expressions. You know, that furrowed brow. Or if you have a teenager, you've seen the rolling of the eyes, you know. You know that your expressions can also communicate to you. But none of these have the power of words. And that is why James wants us to grasp and understand that power. So that we can change our speech away from the way the world tells us to speak. And, and that we would speak distinctly and we would speak with a difference that our, our speech would be radically transformed into the kind of speech that God wants us to use. I'm reminded uh, of a story of Jesus when uh, after the resurrection, uh, two of Jesus' followers had been in Jerusalem and they were walking back home. They were walking back to Emmaus. And they had heard that Jesus had died and were crucified and resurrected. At least they'd heard that he was resurrected, but they really didn't believe it. And so in despair, they were walking back home, disappointed. And, and um, while they were on the way, the Bible says that Jesus appeared to them. Now, we don't know if he just kind of, there he was, or whether he ran out from behind a bush. Don't have any idea. Uh, but, hello? You out there? Uh, anyway, but he, they didn't know who he was, and uh, whether he was wearing a hoodie or something, they didn't know who he was. And so as they're walking along the road, uh, he said, why are you guys so downcast? And they said, well, didn't you hear? And told them about all that was going on. We thought Jesus was the Messiah. And, so the Bible says as they walked along the road, it's about eight miles, that, that he began to unveil the scriptures to them and speak to them about why the Messiah had to die and be resurrected from the dead. And, and uh, they finally got there and they said, hey, would you want to have some dinner with us? And they said, yeah. So they stopped in an burger. And while they were uh, there, Jesus broke the, the bread and handed it to them. And when he handed it to them, the Bible says they suddenly realized who he was. And, and, and then Jesus was gone. Beam me up, God, there's no intelligent life down here. 
And in Luke chapter 2, 24, verse 32, Jesus said these, or th- these guys turned to each other and they said, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? See, that's what I want my words to be like. I want my words, my language, my speech to be the kind of thing that just causes people's hearts to burn, not in a negative way, but a positive way. Words of encouragement, words of knowledge, words of love, words of compassion, words of tenderness, words of encouragement. I want my words to be the kind of words of Jesus that that just set people on fire when he was around them. And that's what God wants for all of us. You see, when I have a radical faith, the, the kind of radical faith that James talks about, we all have a radical faith that's off the charts, that's over the top, that's way above average. And, and when we have this, as we've talked about for the last few weeks, we'll have a radical faith that joyfully sees trials and tests as a way of growing stronger in our faith through radical endurance. And a couple of weeks ago, we'll learn that we'll have a radical faith that understands how Satan tempts me so that I can live as a victor over rather than a victim of sin through radical resistance. And last week we learned, as James taught us, to have a radical faith that matches authentic faith words with authentic faith action through radical behavior. And this week James wants to teach us that a radical faith, to have a radical faith that transforms my heart and my mouth to radically speak only words that honor God and build others up. To radically speak only words that honor God and build others up. Now, how many of you brought your Bibles with you when you came in today? I want to encourage you to always bring your Bibles. How many have read through the book of James this week? I asked you to do that. Good. Love to see those hands up. encourage you to continue to do so for the next several weeks as we go through this study. Evidently, the people to whom James is writing uh, his message uh, had trouble with their tongues, had trouble with their words. As they began to communicate and talk to each other, evidently they had some problems, and, and the words that were coming out of their mouths were not words that were honoring God. The words that they were speaking to others were not words that were building others up. Perhaps there was cursing going on or, or backbiting or, or belittling or sarcasm. And so James addresses this. In fact, he's already hinted at it in our study thus far through the book of James. In James chapter 1, verse 19, James says, Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. You need to be slow. You need to stop as you're communicating. James also tells us in James chapter 1, verse 26, If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue... He deceives himself, and his religious religion is what? Worthless. That's the power of our tongues. And then in James chapter 2, verse 12, James says, Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. We need to let our words be controlled by that power. And now in chapter 3, James makes as his primary focus this radical speech modification that every one of us need to deal with in our own lives. And it begins this way. In James chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, he says this, Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. And in these two verses, James gives us the warnings of the power of our words. He tells us about the warnings of the power of our words. You see, everybody's words have power, incredible power. And especially if you're a teacher or or a preacher or a leader or a person in authority or even a parent, when you act and speak as one in authority, your words have really, really have power. And that's why James says not everybody should be in one in authority because sometimes if you do so and your life and your words don't match up, it does more harm than it does good. That's why it's so critical for us to make sure that not everybody is trying to lead or teach, but you need to make sure that your lives and your words communicate correctly. Teachers, those in authority, have to be even more careful because we carry a tremendous responsibility. We, we carry a tremendous accountability because everyone is watching. And when you begin to teach or lead, you have that awesome accountability. But James says we all struggle with our tongue. It's a constant struggle. We all sometimes have a, a slip of the tongue. None of us is perfect. Can I get an amen to that? None of us is perfect. 
In fact, uh, notice what he says in verse 2. He says, if we're able to keep our tongue or our mouths in check, it's, it's, it's parallel to being perfect and keeping your whole life in check. That's the power of our words. If we can control our mouths, James says, you can control your whole life. The proverb writer says it this way in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 23. Watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut and you'll stay out of trouble. Can I get an amen to that? Amen, yeah. That's how it happens. So James not only cautions us and gives us warnings, but he also gives us some illustration of the power of our words. He gives us some illustrations of the power of our words. Actually, he gives us six specific illustrations. The first illustration is of the bit and the bridle. You know, uh, we probably don't do this so much anymore, but uh, in, the, in the olden days, in James's days, even our own days, people ride horses. They have to put the bridle and put the bit in the horse's mouth. And when you're able to put the bit in that horse's mouth, you're able to have command and control over that animal. Now, that animal is powerful and strong, uh, yet you exert command and control over it when you control that animal's mouth. And that's exactly what James says. In James chapter 3, verse 3, he says, When we put bits into the mouth of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. And James says in the exact same manner, when we can control our mouths, you're able to control your whole life. That's the power of our words. James uses the illustration of a ship rudder. He says, you know, you can have the largest vessel, but that large vessel, if it's, if it's propeller-driven, is still guided and directed by the smallest little rudder. Of course, in James' day, uh, boats were powered either by row, rowing oars or they were powered by the wind. And James says, you can have the largest vessel and you can have the most powerful wind, but the reality is the direction, the course of that vessel is directed by the smallest little rudder that gives us that direction. James says in James 3, chapter 3, verse 4, or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, and yet they're steered by the very small rudder wherever the pilot wants it to go. Now, now the ship rudder and, and the bit in the horse's mouth both work in contrary to forces against them. For instance, the horse is powerful and strong and much more powerful, much stronger than you are. And and it has a mind of its own and it will go wherever it wants to unless you control it. And the ship will be driven by the force of the winds, the direction the wind wants it to go, unless you have the rudder controlling it, working contrary to the forces against it. And in every one of our lives, we all will live our own way, do our own thing in a sinful nature that's within us, unless we can control ourselves. And the way James says we can control ourselves is that we control our tongue. We control our mouths. James says that the tongue is like a spark, That can create a mighty fire as it does so. You know, we've all seen the little signs that said only you can prevent forest fires. How many of you have seen that little sign? And we realize here in the West especially the destructive power of forest fires, the tiniest little spark that can cause such amazing devastation. And James uses that example here. He says you can just have a a little tiny flame, just the the smallest of flames, and yet if you... you, Lots of burn. Uh, and yet, if that flame is alive and you can put it in, it can cause a major flame up. It can cause amazing fire just as a result of that tiniest little spark. James says it this way. He says in James 3, 5, a tongue, uh, likewise, the tongue is the smallest part of the body. Consider what a great fire is set on by the smallest spark. He goes on to say in verse 6, a tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person and sets the whole course of his life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. The word that James uses here for hell is a word that describes a, a trash dump outside of Jerusalem called the Valley of Gehenna. In the ancient days of the pagan, and when the kings uh, uh, steered away from God's word, they allowed them to build altars to, to foreign gods in that area. And one of the Canaanite gods was the god Moloch. And the worship of the god Moloch involved child sacrifice. They built a huge altar made out of bronze, and, and they would set a fire inside of that bronze statue so that the statue would become white hot in its strength and its heat. 
And then people to worship him would bring their firstborn children, babies, and they would lay that baby alive on the arms of the outstretched God of Moloch that was set on fire. And literally the babies would burn alive as they did so. And so as the kings turned their hearts back to God, they called that place defiled and it became a trash dump outside of Jerusalem. And when Jesus came along, as James is writing here, uh, it was a place that was known with, as a defiled place, a place where refuge and trash gathered. And, and it was always burning. It was always on fire. James wants us to get this picture that, that when we let our mouths be controlled by the deadly fire, it's as if hell is controlling those things. It's amazing. Some um, years ago, Nancy and I were getting ready to go on vacation. We we're trying to get all the final stuff done around the house. And so uh, uh, one of, um, uh, as, as we we're getting ready to go, I'd had a fire in the fire pit the night before and I'd shaken up all the ashes and the coals, made sure they were cool. They were just warm. And so uh, trying to get everything done, I dumped those in my dumpster beside the house. And Nancy and I left to go do separate errands. And when I came back and walked into the house, my wife greeted me with one of these. How many of you men have ever seen that, that greeting, you know? And she had that scowl look on her face, and she said, you need to go outside and look at the trash can. So I thought, okay. So I walked around the side of my house, and I saw that my trash can had melted down, and it was just like a huge cow patty in, in, the, in the backyard there. And I came back in, and it was amazing because there was one wheel that was not burnt and a bag of marshmallows that somehow had survived this fire. I have no idea why. And so when we came back inside, I said, what happened? She said, well, when I got home, she said, as I was driving up, I saw this flume of black smoke. And when I turned the corner and saw it was our house, I immediately opened the garage door and jumped out and ran and saw that this dumpster was just burning and, and flames. And so I ran around and got the hose and I put it out. She said, did you know that those coals weren't out when you put them in there? And I said, no, I, I thought they were out. I mean, I could touch the bottom of it. It wasn't hot. But, but thus is the power of those coals. In fact, we had a guy who knew we were going on vacation. He said, can I do anything to help you? And I said, well, would you want to come over and mow my yard once? And he said, I'll be glad to do that. So when I came back from vacation, I went out to take care of the now melted trash can and it was gone. And so uh, I found the guy at church one Sunday and I said, by the way, I said, did you ever wonder about that melted trash? He said, oh, I've been dying to ask you about it, pastor. I just didn't know how to, how to say that. <laughs> now it's funny now, but just think of, of the amazing damage that could have been caused by the smallest little coal that still had the fire within it. It could have caught the fence on fire, the neighbor's house. It could have gotten up under my eve and burned my entire house down and all the memories that we have in there from the tiniest little spark. And James says that is the incredible, incredible power of the tongue. James says the tongue is like a wild animal. In James chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, he said, All animals and birds and reptiles and creatures of the sea are tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, able to, uh, 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 restless evil full of deadly poison. This phrase, restless evil, uh, describes an animal that can break out or is broken out of its cage. And he said that the tongue is like this animal that's trying to get out, trying to get out, and it breaks out. Have you ever had a word break out of your mouth that shouldn't have come out of your mouth? Your brain's in neutral and your mouth's still in gear and, and things happen? We've all had that. I've had the privilege of both riding on a trained tame elephant and also being charged by a wild elephant. And let me tell you, if I had my choices, I'd rather be with the tamed elephant. Its power is under control. And James tells us that we need to recognize the fact that, that God wants us to control our tongue. Every wild animal can be trained by man, but man can't even control his wild words. And that's why we, we need help from heaven. We're going to talk about that in just a few moments. James uh, describes your tongue as a spring, a water spring that, that bubbles up from out of the ground or bubbles out of a rock, and the waters bubble up. And James says it can't be both fresh water and salt water at the same time. It's not possible for that to happen. It bubbles up out of the ground. It's going to be one or the other, not both. Uh, and yet we can sing praise to God. We can stand here and say, I stand with arms high and heart abandoned and sing praise to God. And yet at the same time go to work tomorrow and tell the coarsest joke or, or use language that's unbefitting those who are followers of Christ. And James says you can't have both coming out of the same mouth. 
He tells us in James chapter 3, verse 9 through 11, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can, can both fresh water and salt water flow out of the same spring? A couple of years ago when we were having... Um, uh, one of our special events here at the church, we had some of our parking, some of our people who were serving as parking lot attendants, and they were directing traffic to make sure that the flow of traffic, the incoming flow and the outgoing flow, operated appropriately. And we were sending all of the, the away traffic out through the exit that goes behind the Burger King and the Walmart, and uh, the incoming was coming off of Alma School Road. And so on that particular Sunday, a guy, one of the traffic uh, people came to me and said, I, I had something really strange happen. He said, I was standing out there, and he said, this guy came driving up, and he was leaving, and I, I I tried to wave him out through that entrance, but he, he pointed uh, to the front entrance. And I, I said no and, and waved him out through that side entrance. And, and he, he said no, and he pointed to the front entrance. I said, no, no, you need to go out the side entrance. He said, pointed more vehemently this way. And he, I said, no, this way. And so as he came driving by me, he flipped me the bird. I said, he must have been from another church. <laughs> But, but I wonder, friends, I wonder if, if you can leave this place after praising God and, and speak inappropriately or say things that are inappropriate. Or go, can your mouth spew both cursing and praise? Is that possible? And then James uses his last illustration, and it's the illustration of growing fruit. He said, if you have a, a, a vine that's growing grapes, it's not going to grow figs. If you have a, a tree uh, that's growing one type of fruit, it's, gonna grow, it's not going to grow more than one type of fruit. Now, we have a phenomenon here in Arizona that's called the fruit cocktail tree. So you may have some of those. Where on the, the, the citrus root, they've grafted two different kinds of fruit trees so you can get multiple fruit from the same tree. But in most places in the world, that's not going to happen. If you plant a tree, it's going to bear fruit of the kind of rootstock that you planted. If you plant a vine, it's going to bear the fruit of that rootstock in which you had planted. And that's what James is talking about here. He says in James chapter 3, verse 12, My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives? Can a grapevine bear figs? So if you, you plant a vine that, for grapes, it's not going to grow figs. If you plant a tree uh, to, 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 grow, um, uh, to grow figs, it's not going to grow olives. And J James is saying the same way. If, you're, if your life is rooted in God, it's going to bear that kind of fruit. Now, no, well, actually, full pun intended here. He's talking about the root of the problem. Or I should say more correctly, he's talking about the heart of the problem. And James goes on to describe the real source of our speech problem, our word problem, our tongue problem. In James chapter 3, uh, verses 14 and 15, James says, But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your what? In your what? In your hearts. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven but is earthly, unspiritual, and of the devil. The word the New International translates there, devil, I don't think is the best translation. The word devil, as it's translated, is the word dominia, from which we get the word demon or demonic. And what he's saying is that if our tongues are filled with words that, that speak negative things and hurtful things, if our tongues are using that kind of language, then they're of the earth. They're not the kind of the language that God wants us to use. They're not the language of heaven. They're unspiritual. And they're demonically influenced as we speak them. That's the power of the tongue. You see, we have, we have problems controlling our tongue. And, and when we use negative speech, speech that hurts instead of heals, speech that are negative and hurt people and devastate people, when we have negative speech like gossip where we're, we're speaking against someone or slandering them or saying untruths about them or talking about them behind their back, or when we're lying, we're not speaking truth, we're speaking half-truths or partial truths or little white lies or full black lies or intentionally misleading someone. When, when we're using filthy talk, or the Bible calls it 
coarse jesting, when we're talking about things that we shouldn't be talking about, using language, telling jokes, using expressions, and we say, you know what I mean by that, and we all know what they mean by that. When we're using those kind of languages, that's negative speech. When we're cursing, when we use words that are, are acceptable in our society today. Have you noticed on television, music, radio, where people are using language that never used to be used, now it just seems to be acceptable speech, or when we're using sarcasm, it's one of my problems, we're using sarcasm in our speech. That's negative speech. And when we use this negative speech, it reveals what is in our hearts. It reveals the bitterness. It reveals the selfishness. It reveals the fact that we're buying into the world. It reveals that there's demonic power working in us. And we've set aside heaven's wisdom for the wisdom of this world. Jesus described it this way in Luke chapter 6, verse 45. He said, the good man brings good things out of the good that is stored up in his what? Heart. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil that is stored up in his heart. Now read out loud the next phrase with me. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. Wow. You see, if we're having trouble with our words, what we need is a new heart. That's the heart of the problem. So how do we do that? How are we controlling the power of our words? How can we bring the power of our words into control? How do we do this? Well, let me suggest, first of all, that we we have to get to the heart of the matter. We have to get to the heart of the matter. One of my friends is a Dudley Rutherford, who's the pastor of Shepherd Hills Church in Southern California. Great church, great guy. He's a, Dudley's this big, huge guy, 6'6", six, six, and played basketball, great basketball player. And he tells a story that when he was 15, 16, and they were playing on the varsity team back in Wichita, Kansas, and he was a star, that one of his friends that played on the same team went to the same church. In fact, Dudley's dad was the pastor of that church, and, and the, they decided that they didn't want to use bad language. They didn't want to use curse words. And so they made this pact between each other that if, anyone, if one of them heard uh, the other use a curse word, that they could haul off and hit them in the arm as hard as they could. So he said one day while they were playing in practice, one of his friends, his friend shot a, a ball at the basket and missed it badly, and he shouted out a curse word. And Dudley said, I promptly ran over and hit him as hard as I could in his arm, which caused him to shout out another curse word. So I hit him again, he said. And after a few weeks of this and very bruised arms, they decided there has to be a better way. (laughs) Well, there, there is a better way. But it is costly. And it is radical. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross Daily and follow me. You see, friends, radical faith demands radical sacrifice and is the only way to radical speech. You have to be willing to sacrifice your tongue, you have to be willing to sacrifice your heart and give it to Jesus daily. That's radical. So this morning, let me give you this challenge. Are you willing to crucify your tongue for Jesus daily? That's what he's saying here. That's radical speech. Are you willing to crucify your tongue daily for Jesus? But there's a second way that we control the power of our words, and that is by focusing on words that heal and not hurt. By focusing on words that heal and not hurt. James says it this way in James chapter 3, verse 17. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, and then peace-loving, and considerate, and submissive, and full of mercy, and good fruit, impartial, and sincere. These are the kind of words that come out of a healed heart. 
the kind of a words that come out of a heart that's been sacrificed and dedicated to God. This is the kind of words that will bless other people, words that are pure, the kind of words you could speak if Jesus was standing right beside you, words that are peace-loving, that bring harmony and, and, and goodwill, words that are considered, that are spoken with feelings as you consider what the other person is feeling, words that are submissive where you honor that other person above yourself, words that are full of mercy, that bear good fruit, the, the end product of your words are positive good fruit that are impartial uh, that you're not speaking against anyone else and are sincere they're words that are spoken in truth this is the kind of words that will bless in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29 Paul says it this way do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen These are the words that God wants us to speak. This is radical speech. Words that build up, not tear down. Words that bless, not that hurt. How many remember this old children's rhyme that says, Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will what? Never hurt me. Is that true? No, it's not true. You've said it to your kids, but it's not true. Because words can be devastating. And that's why someone has come up with a very sharp little acrostic that said that we need to think before we speak. Are you willing to think before we speak? And what does that mean? Well, the T in the word think is the word true. We need to speak that which is true, not gossip, not slander, not speak things that are painful or hurtful or devastating. We need to speak that which is true. The H in the word think is helpful. We need to use helpful words, words that are healing, words that are beneficial to the persons that we're speaking to. The I in the word think is inspiring. We need words that that build that other person up, that make that person feel better about themselves, that lift that person up and, and help them live positively. The N in the word think is necessary. We need to use words and only speak that's necessary. You know, many of the times, it'd be better to say nothing. Keep our mouths closed. And the K in the word think is kind. Will the person be better because you spoke to them? Is it a kind thing to say? Is it, will the person be better off because you said what you said to them? Think before we speak. The proverb writer says it this way in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18. Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Those are the kind of words that God desires. So let me, let me give you this challenge. This challenge, if, if you want to have a, a radical speech, would you think before you speak? Would you think, say that is true and helpful, inspiring, necessary and kind, would you think before you speak? And then there's a, a third piece of advice if you want to control the power of your words, and that is simply you need to put a cork in it. Oftentimes we just need to put a cork in it. There's an old adage that says, if you've got nothing good to say, you should say nothing at all. And that's a good way to live our lives. James says in James 1.19, my brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. Sometimes you just need to stop and say, you know, this is not good to say. I'm not going to say anything here. And that's the best course of action. The former president, Calvin Coolidge, said, I have never been hurt by anything that I did not say. And that's a great piece of advice. The proverb writer says it this way in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19. When words are many, sin is not absent. But he who holds his tongue is what? Wise, yeah. Or as Abraham Lincoln said, it'd be better to not say anything and let people think that you're wise than to open your mouth and prove them wrong. So let me ask you this morning, are you willing to admit that you need a bigger cork in your life? Yeah. In the words that we speak. Chuck Swindoll, great writer and preacher, tells a story that when he was in seminary, that one of his fellow students um, had a huge birthmark 
on his face. It was bright red, and, uh, and it, it stretched over most of his face and even wrapped over part of his nose. It was just distinctive. It was bright red and, and covered a large portion of the side of his face. And he said, everyone noticed it. And, and of course, people were kind. They didn't say anything about it. But he said, you know, every, it was so distinctive, and, and it didn't seem to bother the guy at all. And he said, after a period of time, I, I began to be friends with him, and, and um, I asked him the question, um, you know, does that, the birthmark that you have, does, does it bother you? Has it ever bothered you? And he said, well, that. He said, well, a- as early as I can remember, my dad told me that that's where Jesus touched my face before I was born. That he just loved me so much. And before I was born, he just laid his hand lovingly on me and it left this mark. Jesus did so so that I'd always remember his love and always remember his touch on my life. And my dad told me that he also did it so that he could always pick me out of a crowd wherever I was because he just loved me and cared for me that much. That's how special I am to him. And all of my life, he said, I've kind of felt sorry for people that were not lovingly touched like Jesus, like I am. Did you hear what that father did to his son? Did you hear what he did for him? He transformed his life by what he said. What could have been an embarrassment or a shock? What could have been a mark that caused his son to retire, shrink back, to have poor self-image and self-esteem? Caused him to step forward with pride by simple words that were spoken. A few simple words that literally transformed his life life. That is the power of radical speech. And that's the power that God wants for you. Aren't those the kind of words that you want coming out of your mouth? But that's your decision. What will you decide today? Will you pray with me? God, today we've come to you and ask that you would bless us and help us to, to realize how powerful and important it is for us to consider the words that we speak because there is just awesome power in them. And I pray that as we live in this radical faith that we will choose this day to let it affect the way that we speak and the words that we say. That those words might begin with, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and I surrender my life to him as my Savior And my Lord. And Lord, if there are any in this room today, I pray that those are the words that they might express. They would let us know that by noting on their card that they're accepting Christ today or coming to the front and say, I need to talk to you about accepting Christ so that we can help them get on base with God. But Father, that those would be the words that would make a difference for all of eternity. Many of us in this room, God, have made that decision, and yet sometimes we forget about the power of our words. And may we today dedicate ourselves to a radical faith that transforms our tongue so that what comes forth from us is a radical speech that sounds like Jesus. Help us to make those decisions that you want us to make today, God. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.